represent another man. FEMA is the agency of the state government with primary responsibility and authority for emergency preparedness policy and for coordinating hazard mitigation, incident response, and disaster recovery. This includes supporting local governments as requested and coordinating assistance with other state agencies and federal agencies. In order to meet our responsibilities and provide efficient coordination, the agency is organized into four major sections under the executive director and deputy executive director. They are the chief of staff and regional programs, the administration, operations, risk reduction, and strategy. Two of our priorities is consequence management and disaster risk, risk, risk reduction. In the past few months, this spring, uh, spring and now going into summer, we've been very busy for a number of different reasons. We had to do, use a coop event on Wednesday, April 25th, as a precautionary measure. Me and I evacuated our headquarters under the results of an environment inspection we received. Mima remained out of the building for three, over three weeks, but worked through our MOU system and partners to continue our mission seamlessly and back up facilities. And I'd like to thank Parker County and County Executive uh, Glassman for allowing us to be there. On May 15th to the 19th, Washington and Frederick Counties received significant rainfall over the course of a approximately a week, causing flooding and significant damage to residents, businesses, and infrastructure. Governor Hogan recently submitted a major disaster declaration request. The area also has recently received a small business authority declaration. On May 27th, again, our county, Ellicott City, Baltimore County, and the city of Baltimore were among the other areas received significant rainfall and had flash flood in late May. Again, Ellicott City had, was seriously impacted, along with the Catonsville areas in Baltimore County and the western areas of Baltimore City. Local disaster recovery centers were stood up and supported by the state. Damage assessments and invalidation continued, and we anticipate a federal resource being requested shortly. MEMA is actively coordinating recovery for both flooding events through the one-step recovery operations group. Recently, the SRO held a multi-jurisdictional workshop with the areas that were affected, which was very successful. New and upcoming things, one is a complex coordinated terrorist attack grant. MEMA was awarded over $2 million in grant funding to prepare for complex coordinated terrorist, terrorist attacks. They will conduct preparedness planning, planning, training, and exercise activities using these funds. We recently hired a program manager for that to oversee the project. As is mitigation assistance, we're anticipating some opportunities for the local jurisdictions to apply to MEMA for some funds that we hope will become available for the jurisdictions to develop risk reduction and mitigation projects and they'll be applying for these grants this fall and winter. The new thing is know your zone. Hurricane evacuation outreach grant. MEMA along with local emergency managers and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers recently completed a hurricane evacuation study across the state. As part of this study, evacu evacuation zone, zone maps were drawn. The know your zone campaign goal is for all Marylanders who live, work, or vacation in or near an evacuation zone, know which one they are close to. That way, evacuations will be more efficient if and when an official order is given. We've developed an application and a website for residents they can plug into the address and check to see what evacuation zone is. I'd like to thank the Maryland State Fire Association for their partnership for the past year, and thank you, and I hope you have a good conference and convention.
Thank you, past President Thompson. On behalf of the officers and members of the MSFA, we have a special recognition for your agency as well as a gift bag and a mug. Next, we have Chris Robertson from the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, President Bilger, officers, past presidents, delegates, members, and guests. I br bring you greetings on behalf of State Fire Supervisor Monty Mitchell, who's unable to make it today. He's attending the Northeast Forest Fire Supervisors meeting this week in Illinois. I'm glad to be with you this afternoon to give you an update on the activities of the Maryland Forest Service. During 2017, the Maryland Forest Service responded to 107 wildfires that burned 2,175 acres. This included four large wildfires greater than 100 acres. Leading causes of wildfires in Maryland continue to be debris burning and arson. Also in 2017, the agency and partners conducted 56 prescribed burns for hazardous fuel reduction on 1,495 acres. So far for 2018, the agency has responded to 72 wildfires burning 350 acres. Maryland continued to support the mobilization of resources nationally last year. The agency dispatched two Type 6 wildland fire engines that were on assignment in Montana from July through September, rotating a total of six engine crews. Also mobilized were two 20-person Type 2 initial attack fire crews on incidents in California, Colorado, and South Dakota. Fifteen additional individual single resources assisted on incidents in Montana, Oregon, West Virginia, Utah, and Wyoming. The Maryland Forest Service trained and red-carded over 100 personnel for deployment in 2017. The 2017 Volunteer Assistance Grants were awarded to 45 volunteer fire departments in 17 counties. Grant reimbursement payments of $90,843 were issued to the 43 departments that completed their approved grant projects. All projects included the minimum of 50-50 match and the total project cost in 2017 was $200,238. Six additional fire departments received fire rakes and bladder bags for their brush units. The 2018 Volunteer Fire Assistance Grant application period is currently open and accepting applications. Maximum grant award is $3,000 with $6,000 in qualifying expenses. Applications are available online or by contacting the fire staff, and we also have some down at our booth downstairs. Application deadline is July the 16th. Grant awards will be announced by the end of September. All eligible volunteer fire companies are encouraged to apply. The DOD Federal Fire Property Program and Federal Excess Property Programs continue to support equipping needs of fire departments statewide. In 2017, the program processed 126 transfer orders and acquired nearly $2 million in equipment for the state of Maryland. All property is acquired at no cost to the agency for use by the Maryland Forest Service and volunteer fire departments. Equipment acquisitions included items such as two and a half ton trucks, pickups, vans, SUVs, UTVs, dump trucks, generators, office furniture, and many other miscellaneous items. Departments can submit a Google request form to request equipment that is interesting in acquiring. The agency is an aging fleet, but is making investments into improving our wildfire suppression equipment. The FY18 fleet replacement included four Type 6 engines and two Type 7 engines, four pickups and four pickup trucks. The new brush units are being placed in service in Allegheny, Carroll, Cecil, Charles, Garrett, and Wicomico counties. Additionally, two new John Deere 650K fire dozers are expected to be delivered in July to replace aging equipment in the eastern and southern regions. Our workforce is experiencing a number of retirements, and the trend is expected to continue over the next several years. Fortunately, the department is receiving approval to fill the positions. For the fire staff, Randy Camp was recently promoted as the fire manager for the western portion of the state. Forest rangers have also been recently filled in, the, in Carroll, Charles, and Montgomery counties. 
In early June, for the first time, Maryland hosted the Mid-Atlantic Wildland Fire Training Academy at Garrett College in McHenry. This was the 11th academy sponsored by the Mid-Atlantic Fire Compact and the U.S. Forest Service. The academy provided 14 wildland fire training courses to 180 students during the week to refresh and enhance qualifications of firefighters in attendance. Finally, I would like to say thank you to the leadership of the presidents, officers, and the members of companies of the MSFA that work with the Maryland Forest Service on a regular basis. You as volunteers are essential to helping us with our mission of wildfire suppression and prevention. Please stop by our booth and see the ways that our agency can assist your department. Thank you. Thanks, sir. On behalf of the MSFA, we have a bag for you and a mug. Now I would like to introduce Alex Cardella from MCAC. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Cardella. I'm a uh, intelligence analyst for the Maryland Coordination and Analysis Center. Just wanted to thank uh, President Bilger, members of the executive board, and uh, members of the MSFA for uh, allowing me to speak today. So as I mentioned, I'm the intelligence analyst for fire and EMS for the state. The Maryland Coordination Analysis Center is basically a federal task force of uh, state, local, and federal law enforcement and uh, homeland security professionals. And our job is to make sure that you all have the homeland security and terrorism information that you need to do your jobs and to do them safely. Uh, as you'll hear tomorrow, there's more of a push for fire and EMS to get involved in active assailant response. So we recognize that you all are being asked to take on more and more responsibilities in this realm. So part of my job is to make sure that you have the information that you need to make informed decisions uh, when responding to those types of incidents. Um, I'll keep it really brief here, but the one I'll, I'll make a couple quick plugs for uh, some programs that we have going on. We have the uh, Fusion Liaison Officer Program. It's an eight-hour training block where we bring in members of the uh, Federal Bureau Investigations Joint Terrorism Task Force, the Department of Homeland Security, and some other experts to kind of give you an understanding of what the terrorism environment looks like now, to give you an understanding of how terrorism cases are investigated, and to uh, give you some information on suspicious activities that we like you uh, like you to report to us. You, know, you drive down the highways in Maryland, you see the see something, say something, 1-800-492-TIPS number. That's our office. So um, if there's any interest in those programs, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, President Bilger has my information, as does uh, past President Lewis. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Again, on behalf of the officers and members of the MSFA, we have a convention bag and mug for you. great pleasure that I stand before you to introduce Mr. Clay Stamp. Mr. Stamp is the Senior Emergency Management Advisor to our Governor, Larry Hogan, and the Chair of the Governor's Emergency Management Advisory Council. Mr. Stamp currently serves as the Executive Director of the Opioid Operation Command Center, working with Emergency Management System to effectively and efficiently coordinate statewide efforts in combating the heroin and opioid crisis in Maryland. And Mr. Stamp is also the director of the Tulba County Department of Emergency Services and has extensive experience working in disasters, including the World Trade Center attacks, Hurricane Katrina, and the civil unrest in Baltimore. Clay came up through the ranks in Ocean City. As a young paramedic firefighter, became first emergency management director and eventually director of emergency services, where he shepherded the development of many cutting-edge services. Additionally, Clay is one of us, a Maryland volunteer, Maryland's best. He began as a cadet with the Ocean City Volunteer Fire Company and joined his service as a firefighter. He supported the work of the MSFA by serving on the EMS committee. He is currently a life member of the Ocean City Volunteer Fire Company and an honorary member of the Oxford Fire Department in Tulsa County. Mr. Clay Stamp. Good afternoon. How's everybody today? 
Good, good. It's certainly my privilege to be here today because truly I am one of you. I'm a member of the Volunteer Fire Service family in Maryland. I'm very proud of it. So uh, the presentation I'm going to give to you today is a difficult presentation. It's a presentation that, um, you know, we need to take seriously, and certainly the governor of Maryland has taken it seriously. Um, for those of you who know me, I'm a long-serving emergency manager in the state of Maryland. I'm in my hometown of Ocean City, Maryland right now. And so I've had a great career learning to be a student of the National Response Framework. The governor, when he ran for office, he toured the state of Maryland from he, he, all the way out in western Maryland, southern Maryland, the eastern shore. And what he heard from everybody is you've got to do something about this crisis. It's ripping families apart and it's killing Marylanders. And so he, he, uh, you know, he got involved in a process to try to combat this opioid uh, uh, crisis. All right, let me get my slides together here. So first thing I want to talk about is the impact of this crisis. We all know that way too many people are dying. So let me, can I get this screen? Perfect. A little bit further this way, if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay, so we are seeing somewhere between 42 and 45 people a day that are dying in the United States of America, about six a day in Maryland. And you know, I've been involved now for 16 months working for the governor to attack this crisis. I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategy. But 16 months in, I get up in the morning and I pinch myself. And I ask myself a question that I'll ask you to consider. How can 64,000 Americans die in the United States of America in 2016, and we as a nation aren't standing at the tallest building shouting from the top of our lungs that we've got to do something about this? 64,000 people in 2016. And we're going to probably see 70,000 in 2017 when those numbers are finally released. So, what, so what's killing these individuals? So you've heard the story. Largely, this was a prescriber-based crisis initially. Pharma created a fifth vital sign, blood pressure, pulse, respirations, temperature, and pain score. They launched a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar marketing campaign to get that well entrenched and made it part of the regulatory framework to make sure we address pain. And they marketed a drug that they said was not addictive, but it was addictive. And if you look at the data, I know it's hard to see from where you are today, you'll see that in 2012, the crisis began to escalate. People began getting hooked on prescribed opioids, such as oxycodone and oxycontin. As you look at this slide, you see that increasing um, in 2015 into 2016. Something happened in Maryland last year that's interesting. This crisis is evolving. It's evolving from a prescriber-based epidemic or crisis to an illicit-based drug epidemic or crisis. So you'll see a slide in a moment, but you'll see that we are, the physicians are now not prescribing as many opioids, which is good. We're about, we've seen about a 14% reduction and the number of prescribed opioids being written. But you'll see also something happened in 2016, and if you could see this, if you could see these lines clearer, and I apologize that you can't, you'll see that the number of individuals uh, that were dying from prescribed opioids began to decrease. That's a good thing. That means we are making a difference. The prescribers are listening to us. We're getting the message out there. Fewer people are dying from prescribed opioids. The second thing you'll see is that heroin is decreasing. Deaths related to heroin are decreasing. What you also would see is deaths related to cocaine are increasing in conjunction with over 70% of our deaths last year were from illicit fentanyl. This is a, thin, a, a synthetic chemical that is largely made internationally from the China and is shipped into the United States of America two ways. One, direct through our U.S. mail service, through transactions on the internet, in the dark web, and secondly, through an unholy relationship with the Mexican cartel, who are using traditional heroin routes and flooding this poison into our streets. So you'll see in this slide that we are getting, making headway with the prescribers. And we've, we've, we've instituted processes by which we're encouraging physicians to prescribe fewer opioids and look at alternatives because of the addictive nature. 
Now, there are two caveats that we talk to physicians about that we need to keep front and center with them. We don't want the pendulum to swing too far the other way and have individuals that truly have pain that can't get pain medicine. And secondly, we don't want people that are managing their addiction through prescribed opioids to be cut off and thrown into the most dangerous illicit drug market that's out there right now. We want to try to get them into treatment. So this slide depicts the difference between heroin in 2015 to 16. You'll see we made uh, some headway on the heroin side, but you'll see in the other slide how fentanyl is blown up. And these are the fatalities uh, by jurisdiction in Maryland. You'll see the Metro Corps down in the Southern Maryland have uh, been largely impacted by the uh, fatalities with fentanyl. But in, in general, all of Maryland is being affected. The other thing that we deal with that we watch very closely are non-fatal overdoses. And I'm preaching to the choir talking to you because you're answering the 911 calls. You're exhausted. You're going out there time and time and time and time again to resuscitate individuals from non-fatal overdoses. And I know it's a challenge. But we had 18, over 18,000 non-fatal overdoses last year in our 45 different emergency departments across Maryland. We know there's a higher propensity for these to re-overdose. So we have instituted programs in our ERs across Maryland working with the hospital association to come up with standard discharge protocols, which include hooking them up with peer recovery coaches, discharging with naloxone, and trying to have a, hand, a warm handoff to treatment for those that are, are interested. But understand, somebody with substance use disorder, in general, will relapse five times before they actually start making progress. So that you're gonna see those individuals again and again. But we, it's a very important that we, we institute these programs because these individuals are more, uh, uh, again, uh, they, they, they have a higher propensity to re-overdose. So what are we doing about it? So in Maryland, we're, we've, we've, uh, we've embraced the national response framework. You all know about that. A part of the national response framework is the incident command system. What does that mean? That means we've attached this opioid operational command center to MEMA because MEMA is one of the only organizations in Maryland that reaches across the stovepipes of state government. And it, it facilitates a, a high degree of coordination for crisis. That's first. Second, it provides a neutral springboard for creative ideas from the private sector and others that can help us attack this crisis. We have four overarching goals, and those four overarching goals are in essence to try to reduce the number of deaths and overdoses across Maryland. And we have a, we have a three-pronged strategy we're using, which is incredibly important. It's important that we try to expand treatment and recovery capacity. We know that the United States of America has not prioritized treatment for mental health and, frankly, health for uh, people who have substance use disorder. As much as I would like to flip a switch and turn it on and have crisis response, inpatient, outpatient, recovery housing, you don't flip a switch. And to those individuals that are being personally affected by this, it's never going to be fast enough. But I will tell you that we are making progress across the state. We've, we've changed rules and regulations for Medicaid that allows the lifting of a cap of 16 beds for residential treatment to as many as you can open and operate. And I could run down a list of things that are positive moves. But once again, it takes some time. We are moving quickly to expand treatment and recovery service for those in need. The second issue that we have to really keep in mind is enforcement. The difference between now and several years in the past during the crack epidemic, which we don't want to repeat failed policies of the past, is we don't need to take individuals that have substance use disorder and put them in jail and give them a criminal record so that then when they come out, they can't get a job. We need to get them into treatment. We've convinced our law enforcement agencies through law enforcement assisted diversion to try to get those individuals into treatment. And those are programs such as the one in Baltimore called the LEAD program and several others around Maryland that we try to, we're trying to expand those programs across Maryland. But make, moment, make no mistake that the dealing of these poisons in our street is a supply and demand business. It's about the money. They don't care about the people that are dying. It's important that we use every effort that we can to coordinate to try to disrupt and disorganize drug trafficking organizations that are flooding our streets. We need to get behind our law enforcement community, intelligence community, and, and help them stem the tide. But listen to that word, stem the tide.
because the reality is the only way out of this is to interrupt the demand because the United States of America is a consumer nation. One thing we're good at is we consume. We always meet demand in this country, whether it's good or bad. And if we want to get true success in this, while we treat those that need treatment and we stem the tide through enforcement, once we take the demand away, supply will disappear. And that's why we've got to get into our schools and regain momentum that we lost when we gave up the fight and said that just say no didn't work. The D.A.R.E. program didn't work. The war on drugs didn't work. We stopped teaching our, our children largely. We stopped teaching our, our children about the dangers of drugs. And it took a law in Maryland to be passed, and the governor signed it, to reinstitute drug education from the third through the twelfth grade. They are our future. We have to draw a circle around our children and say, you can't have our kids. That's the true answer of how we're going to combat this. The governor signed a declaration declaring a state of emergency. He did that to get everyone's attention, to say, this is a priority, and I want all efforts toward it. He created this Opioid Operational Command Center. It's an it's a, it's a emergency operations center. I don't need to explain to you what that means, because you all know what that means. It's really critically important that we, 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 we take real-time information and we share that back and forth with our health officers and our emergency managers in the counties in Baltimore City across Maryland who have established local coordinating bodies. These are our partners. These opioid operational, uh, these opioid intervention teams are in each county. And what I will say to you is the governor told the health officers and the emergency managers to lead this effort and to pull that coordinated body together in each community. If you're not at the table, you need to engage them when you go home. Engage them. Hold them accountable. We give them funding to try to make a difference in this crisis. This is just a, a makeup of who attends these meetings. I know it's hard to see. I apologize for that. It really is hard to see up there, isn't it? So one of our tactics is, I call it the swap and share. The first thing we need to do is find out what's working across Maryland and share it. And that is the first thing we did. We have programs that are working in Anne Arundel County with safe stations. People can come in any time if they need help. We launched art competitions in certain areas of Maryland, and we're using drug money, drug seizure money, to give children scholarships for college. We have, we, we have all kinds of programs here that we need to share with other jurisdictions, and we are, and other jurisdictions are adopting them. There are some statewide initiatives that we're behind, and some of them include instituting this process in the hospital emergency departments I talked about, that same process in our correctional centers across Maryland, in our clinicians' offices across Maryland. We've instituted a recovery program in Montgomery County as a pilot to provide recovery services to high school kids that are suffering with addiction so they can continue to go to school and get their diploma while they're in recovery. So what, are you, so what does this mean for the volunteer for fire service? Look, you all are a big family. I'm a part of your family. In 1972, a long time ago, I came to a fork in a road. I could go left or I could go right. And I chose the left road. And I'm standing here in front of you today. I haven't, and believe me, I've made mistakes. But I stand here before you because I, I said when I left here, I went to work for the governor, I was interviewed by the local paper, and they wanted to know a little bit about my past. I said, yeah, I was raised by wolves at the firehouse. And I didn't let the pause go as long as I am today, but I let a little pause go by, and I said they were giants of men. They taught me as a 14-year-old boy to shake a hand of a man and look in their eyes and to mean what you say, say what you mean. And when you, when you do something, do it right. Right? Why is that important I tell you about the fork in the road? A lot of my friends took the other road. They didn't fare so well. Why am I talking about the fork in the road? Every one of us, especially children, have an innate desire to belong to something. We're struggling as a volunteer fire service in Maryland, across the country, to get members. Get your cadet programs up and running and get them the road so they can choose that fork. Because I can tell you what's on the other road. There are gangs out there. 
that will, will take our children and make, them, and, and make them feel like they belong. They'll give them colors, they'll give them tattoos, they'll give them money, and they'll hijack their lives. You, you are in a position to make a difference. You did for me. Let's do it for the future. Look, there's four core principles I talk about if you want to talk about how to solve this crisis. Number one, there's awful stigma associated with this. This is a socially divisive crisis. People have very strong feelings about how we should do, how, how we should handle it, what we should do, and what we should not do. But one thing I've done this whole year is I've met with the people that have been affected that have contacted the governor. And I've listened to families, I've listened to individuals, I've listened to siblings. And one of the threads that I hear is, please, don't let my loved one become a number. We have to keep a face on this. These are human beings. Human beings that have fallen into the trap and they need help. Families that don't know what to do. They need people to wrap around them and engage them. We need to provide help for people that need help. We need to have empathy. Which one of us haven't had challenges in our life? We need to elevate that conversation. We need to focus our energy in this crisis more than any other crisis. We have to get behind prevention, enforcement, and expanding treatment recovery. You need all three. We need to use data wisely. We need to measure what works and what doesn't work. And finally, we need to establish expectations. We didn't get into this overnight, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. But you know what? There's probably no more important crisis facing the United States of America right now is this drug crisis. Some of the most creative and artistic individuals in the United States of America are more prone to addiction. And we have poisons coming from an international source flooding our streets and killing them. If we don't deal with it aggressively and assertively right now, we're going to wake up in five years and not be the same United States of America that we are today as innovators and creators. So join me, join the governor, and engage your communities to make a difference. I thank you very much. Officers and members, we have a official mug for you in a bag. Mr. Clay Stamp. time we have Mr. Lynn Goreroy to give a report on Mifri Tech. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, President Bilger, Vice Presidents Blair and Faust, honored guests, delegates, on behalf of Secretary of Higher Education, James D. Fielder, Jr., and our new chairman, John Jerome, I bring you greetings. Over the last year, the Maryland Fire Rescue Education and Training Commission has met numerous times to discuss issues that have affected the fire service training needs of this great state. The commission continues to monitor the funding to implement the Charles W. Riley Scholarship Program. We are happy to announce that we have 120 applicants for the 2017 2018 award year. However, there are only 33 that have completed all the necessary requirements and were awarded almost $99,000. We encourage you and take back to your membership to advise your members to go on to the Maryland Higher Education website for the application and the rules for the Riley Scholarship Program. We need to emphasize 
strong need to complete all the forms in a timely fashion so your folks would take the benefit of this program. We are still planning meetings with the Secretary of Higher Education to develop a more meaningful dialogue of the roles and responsibilities of the Commission. We have several new members and we are in the midst of redevelopment of our committees and our goals and objectives and our work groups in accordance with the statute and its intent. Each year, the Commission prepares a yearly report that is mandated to be submitted to the Secretary of Higher Education and the Governor. Over the last few years, we have been unable to provide each department with a copy of that report due to budget constraints. We are trying to work to better that communication to you. But in the meantime, you can find that report on the Maryland Higher Education Commission website for your viewing and reading pleasure. In closing, we look forward to working with President Blair and the other officers of the MSFA in the coming year. We wish President Bilger well as he finishes the term of his office, and we wish all of you success in the balance of your convention. Thank you. At this time, bring the podium chief, Mike Robinson, report from the MI Pro Qua Board. Thank you, Mr. President. And President Bilger, officers and members of the Maryland State Firemen's Association, as the chair of the Maryland Fire Service Personnel Qualifications Board, I am happy to present before this body our annual report. Uh, in the year 2017, we were very honored to present our 150,000th certification. That's 150,000 certifications we have issued since our inception, uh, which was 1986, some 32 years ago. As we continue now in our 32nd year, uh, we are honored to continue the work that the State of Maryland Fire Service unanimously directed us to begin 32 years ago. We now have issued a total of 154,000 certifications in areas from telecommunicator to fire officer to fire investigator to firefighter to hazardous materials technician, a total of over 25 certifications, both uh, coming from the NFPA professional qualification standards, as well as several Maryland standards, which this year we have expanded into EMS officer. Uh, the board continues to work, and the board is successful only due to the efforts of many of you. I'd like to ask now that any of our alternates or representatives who are in the audience Please stand for recognition. Stand if you're an alternate or representative. Okay, this is how we operate. Every county, every major jurisdiction is afforded one alternate, one representative. We come together as we did about an hour ago for our annual meeting. And I'd like to acknowledge this year our vice chair, uh, Mr. R. Keith Fairfax of the Bay District Volunteer Fire Company who has retired as the vice chair, and he's served since our very first meeting in Annapolis in 1986. So let's acknowledge Keith Fairfax for his many years of service to the board. I'd also like to honor this year's recipient of our highest award, which is the Russell J. Strickland Award given to the individual who makes the greatest impact to the board, and that was uh, Assistant Director of MIFRI, Larry Preston. Let's acknowledge Larry for his award. And I'd like to say that the board continues to work on your behalf. Uh, we're not finished in our mission. We continue to move forward. Uh, we're going to be bringing forth some initiatives in the next year, which we'll probably have an announcement for you at next year's convention, and uh, check with your local representatives and alternates to keep up with what we're doing. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the representation that the Maryland State Firemen's Association uh, brings to the board, and the board's executive committee is made up of the MSFA, the Professional Firefighters of Maryland, IAFF, the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, the Training Commission, Maryland Fire Rescue Education Training Commission, 
Maryland Council of Fire Academies, uh, the Office of the State Fire Marshal, and the Maryland Fire Chiefs. So all the major entities within the fire service in Maryland are represented along with your county representatives. We work together to develop consensus. Certification is all about the individual being recognized for their achievement. And the most important thing is this is still a voluntary system. And Maryland is probably the only certification system in the country that remains voluntary. That means you can be certified or not be certified. It's not mandated by any state entity. And because of that, we believe we've been successful. We've taken off in most jurisdictions, most bylaws of volunteer fire companies have been changed over the years to reflect our certification requirements. And again, that's all been voluntary. So um, our real tribute is to each of you that sits out there that makes our system work. And my final thing, I'd like to call upon President Bilger and give him an official copy of our annual report. And finally, if you have never been certified, stop by our booth downstairs. We're co-located with MIFRI, and if you've ever attended MIFRI courses, even if long in the past, you're probably eligible for certification at some level. So we encourage you to take advantage of this and show your professionalism and uh, participate in your system, the Maryland Fire Service Personnel Qualifications Board. So I'll be presenting this to the President, and I thank you all for your continued support. Thank you again, Chief. Now we have with us the State Fire Marshal Brian Dracy. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. You hear me uh, speak every now and then about uh, our failures, uh, successes amongst our many failures. And uh, if you indul let me indulge me just for a little bit this morning, this afternoon, before I give my presentation, I want to tell you about a success story we had here in Salisbury. At the end of May, we had a uh, fire in a single-family home occupied by a family. Uh, two small young men in there, two brothers were in the house in their bedrooms at the time when they heard a the smoke alarm go off in their house. They exited the bedroom, saw smoke in the hallway, thought it was, might have been grandma's cooking, but unfortunately, they found that there was a fire in the living room. So immediately, they dropped down to their knees to crawl out of the house, exited the house, did not go back inside, were tempted to go back inside, but went around and tried to alert the other family members. The other family members were alerted as well, and, uh, and also all everybody escaped unharmed and was able to put the fire out and call the fire department. They learned that in their education at school, their fire prevention during fire prevention week or during fire prevention classes, that's where they learn to do that. And so that's a great success story for us and it tells you just how much it is important to continue to get that fire prevention message out there to our younger folks, to our seniors, and our folks with disabilities. So if I could get uh, Jair and Jakai to come up here, we have some presentations for you gentlemen for the outstanding job that you did.
like to present to you official bags of the convention for the service that you did to your family and the community. Outstanding job, huh? I'm telling you, it pays. I keep telling you, know, we need to get out in that community more. We need to do that because we have these success stories. That's why we go out there and do it. So I want to bring you greetings from uh, Governor Larry Hogan, Lieutenant Governor Boyd K. Rutherford, and Colonel William Palazzo, the Superintendent of the Maryland State Police. On behalf of the entire staff of the Office of State Fire Marshal, I want to congratulate your association presidents, Mark Dolger and Vivian Boyd. Your terms of office have been extremely productive, and your service to your members is one your entire association should be very proud of. As most of you know, the agency suffered a tragic event at the end of December. Deputy State Fire Marshal, Deputy Chief State Fire Marshal Sander Cohen was struck and killed on December 8, 2017 when he stopped to assist a motorist on Interstate 270 in Montgomery County. That individual turned out to be another law enforcement officer, supervisory special agent Carlos Wolf of the FBI. Chief Cohen was an exemplary investigator and leader who took great pride in his law enforcement career and he looked after his folks under his command. He devoted himself to protecting and serving the citizens of Maryland. Sander truly died a hero, trying to help someone in need. His willingness to stop on a busy interstate to assist a stranger is indicative of the dedication and commitment he had to others. He is an example of the good in people and reflects the values of the Office of the State Fire Marshal. I want to take this time to thank everybody who reached out to us during this difficult time. And I'd ask that you keep Sander and the Cohen family in your thoughts and prayers. Deputy Chief Cohen was also a captain with the Rockville Volunteer Fire Department, and he served in the Rockville community for many, many years there at a Station 3 in Rockville. It's now my distinct privilege to present to you the report for the Office of the State Fire Marshal. The Maryland Fire Incident Reporting System is an extremely valuable resource to collect data and can be used in determining what actions we are needed to prevent fires in the future and to provide this valuable data to our local and state elected officials. On-time reporting continues to be a struggle for some departments. We're asking that all departments have their reports to our agency by the 10th of each month for the preceding month's responses as required by the statute. Please ensure that all reports are complete and free of any errors prior to submission. During calendar year 2017, the total number of fires reported in the state was 15,028. This is a 13.5% decrease over those fires in 2016. Out of those fires last year, 6,560 were structure fires. We had a reported 186 civilian injuries, which is a 25% increase over the 149 injuries reported in 2016. And also we had 174 fire service injuries were reported in 2017 while involved in firefighter activities. Three firefighter line of duty deaths occurred in 2017, two as a result of a medical emergency, and one as a result of a vehicle collision. I'm happy to report that in the last three years, we've not had one firefighter death involved in a fire department or fire fighting activity. So we're doing something great there to protect those folks from the fire ground. The estimated total property loss was $153,421,529. In 2017, the state of Maryland saw the number of fire deaths increase by 4.4% when compared to 2016. The total number of fire deaths in 2017 was 71, 
which is indicative above, represents an increase in the 68 fire deaths suffered in 2016. Nine fatal residential structure fires occurred where smoke alarms were known to have functioned at the time of the incident. However, 15 lives were still lost. 10 lives were lost in eight fires where smoke alarms were either not present or non-functioning. 20 fatal fires were reported where operational status or presence of smoke alarms were unknown. With these 20, within these 20 fires, we lost 26 lives. I want to stress again that like last year, again, we saw over 100 folks saved this last year by residential sprinklers, and again, over 200 saved by smoke alarm activations in the home. So there's making a difference, continues to make a difference. During 2017, residential fatal fires accounted for over 84% of all fatal fires. Over 26% of fire death victims involved were ages of 70 and older. This is an increase when compared to 2016 when 16% or only 11 victims perished. Four fatal fires occurred with victims aged 90 or older in 2017, including a 160-year-old man. 12 victims under the age of 18 died in 2017, accounting for 18% of the fire deaths, the same as in 2016. Unfortunately, Baltimore City had a very tragic year last year with 30 fire deaths which represented almost an 88% increase over the 16 fire deaths that were reported in 2016. Baltimore County experienced 12 fire deaths compared to six in 2016. Prince George's County had reported eight fire deaths in 2017, which was a decrease from the 11 fire deaths in 2016. Additionally, Montgomery, Charles County experienced four deaths, and Arundel and Washington County experienced three fire deaths, and Carroll and Queen Anne Counties had two fire deaths each, and Howard and St. Mary's and Somerset Counties had one fire death each. Sadly, the five-year average for fire deaths in Maryland has slightly increased to 67 per year, although better than the 1975 through 1988 when fire deaths remained over 100 each year. We still have a tremendous amount of work to do in our efforts to reduce fire deaths across the state. In 2017, there was also an increase in the total number of multiple fatality fires which accounted for 16.7% of the 54 total fires for the year. During 2016, the percentage of multi-fatality fires was at 12.5% of the total fires for that year. The months of March, August, and November 2017 resulted in two multi-fatality fires for each of the three months, resulting in 15 of the total multiple deaths. Even though January only had one multiple fatality fire reported to claim their lives, six children in one incident. In 2017, similar to multi-fires, the number of multi-deaths and fatal fires increased in comparison to the prior years to 26 deaths or 36.6% of the 71 total deaths reported for the year. Multiple deaths and fatal fires in 2016 were recorded at 19 deaths or 27.9%. Of the 68 total deaths in 2015 recorded 24 deaths, or 37.5% of the 64 total deaths. One staggering number that came to light last year is that seven individuals were killed by fire being used as a weapon. These were intentionally set fires where seven individuals were killed. We must continue to be vigilant in all that we do, even on the fire ground, and you can view the entire 2017 fire fatality report on our blog site. Reporting continues to present hazards which can result in catastrophic fire-related events that jeopardize the safety of all concerned, including but not limited to the occupants and you, the emergency responders. The Office of State Fire Marshal continues to educate the public regarding the dangers of hoarding. 13 deaths resulted from 11 hoarding-related fires, which is almost 25% of the total fires reported for the entire year, representing an increase in comparison to previous years. The following is a report summarizing the fire-related deaths that were complicated by the conditions of hoarding reported in the year 2017. An undetermined dwelling fire claimed the lives of three innocent children. Including the complications caused by hoarding, it was also reported that the dwelling had no working smoke alarms present at the time of the fire. An undetermined living space fire, which with the reported presence of non-working smoke alarms, resulted in the demise of a 36-year-old female but remarkably, three other adults were able to escape this blaze. A residential kitchen fire caused by an electrical failure of a coffee maker claimed the life of a 34-year-old female, 
and working smoke alarms were reported present at the time of the incident, but she was unable to escape due to the hoarding conditions. The OSFM extends congratulations to each fire department and local jurisdiction that suffered no fire deaths or experienced decreases in the numbers of fire deaths last year. Twelve counties experienced no fire fatalities in 2017. It's almost half the state, but we had still had an increase last year. So these counties include Allegheny, Calvert, Caroline, Cecil, Dorchester, Frederick, Garrett, Hartford, Kent, Talbot, Lacomico, and Worcester. Talbot and Caroline counties have experienced only one fire death in the last five years. As always, the OSFM follows this year's session of the Maryland General Assembly. The MSFA is to be commended for their leadership, diligence, and continued support in working with the Office of the State Fire Marshal and other members of the Maryland Fire Service. The MSFA Legislative Committee Chairman Steve Cox and his entire committee continue to be vigilant on key issues, share important information on topics, and communicate with key legislators. Their dedication to the MSFA membership to ensure that all the volunteers across the state remain safe and recognized in Annapolis is to be commended. As most of you know, this legislative committee that was there this year is, is going away. And I can't thank them enough for the last five years that I've worked with them down in Annapolis to get legislative passed, not only to help you all in what you do each and every day, but to help the citizens across the state of Maryland with residential sprinklers, with smoke alarms, and those things like that that are continue to help save the folks across this state. This year, Senate Bill 728, sponsored by Senator King of Montgomery County, eliminated the sale of battery-only smoke alarms that are not a 10-year sealed battery unit with a hush function feature. This bill, which was signed by Governor Hogan, will take effect on October 1st of this year. Obviously, this was a great success for us, because obviously this is going to eliminate the confusion for the consumers when they go out to buy smoke alarms now after October 1st. You'll only be able to buy the 10-year sealed battery smoke alarms. Battery-only smoke alarms that had to be installed within homes as of January 1st of this year must be a 10-year sealed battery unit with a husk function feature. These alarms are required on every level of the home and outside of each sleeping area. Hardwire smoke alarms that have a battery backup do not have to meet the 10-year sealed battery requirement. As the State Fire Marshal, I wholeheartedly appreciate the partnerships our agencies share with local and state governments as well as private industry. These, partners help, these partnerships help us secure resources, disseminate information, provides training, and allows us to be more effective at accomplishing our tasks in the pursuit of fire and life safety. Our partnership with the Capital Region Fire Sprinkler Association, a chapter of the National Fire Sprinkler Association, has provided training for fire inspectors across the state for the last several years. And we thank them for this continued successful program. It's been really great. We have over 100 inspectors come to training quarterly across the state that that agency puts on for them for free. They provide them lunch, and uh, it's a great educational experience for all our inspectors across the state. Over the many years, our public-private partnership with Pepco and Delmarva Power has enabled the distribution of well over 25,000 smoke alarms. Statewide initiatives advocating the installation, maintenance, and testing of 10-year sealed battery smoke alarms coupled with developing and practicing home fire escape plans to include closing doors at night and while escaping a fire, continue to help communities reduce fire deaths and injuries, as we saw here just a little while ago. We are starting to see a difference this year with the 10-year smoke alarms being installed. We capture all the smoke alarm saves, residential sprinkler saves across the state, and we've seen a lot more smoke alarm saves since January 1st, since the 10-year sealed batteries smoke alarms are being installed in homes. As a reminder, please take part in the Community Risk Reduction Weekends offered each year for the fire departments across the state to enter into their respective communities and offer installation of the 10-year smoke alarms and provide fire and life safety information. On Saturday, March 25th of last year, the Public Fire Life Safety Educator Seminar was held at the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute in College Park. Over 60 motivated personnel attended the outstanding event and provided timely and topical information. The event includes topics such as safe, safe, safety for seniors, hoarding prevention and advocacy. We also had the pleasure of meeting Flash Max that day and to learn the new strategies for teaching prevention. Side-by-side -side burn was also conducted to give us a look at the importance of residential fire sprinklers. Please remember at this year's event, a special residential fire sprinkler helmet from Alert All was introduced. 
purchase of this item remains available, which includes a 25% discount for all MSFA members using discount code MSFA25. I really have to thank Teresa and the Fire Prevention Life Safety Committee. They do a great job each year. Obviously, we partner with them throughout the year uh, in promoting these efforts, and uh, it's just one of the great committees that MSFA has that we work with on a continuous basis. The next statewide community risk reduction weekend is scheduled for October 21st and 20, 20th and 21st of 2018. I ask that all Maryland Fire Departments use this opportunity to check and or install life saving 10-year sealed battery smoke alarms in the homes of citizens they serve and have sworn to protect from the efforts of fire. The community risk reduction weekends for 2019 are May 18th and 19th and October 19th and 20th. The Mid-Atlantic Life Safety Conference celebrated its 58th year anniversary on September 26, 2017. Originally billed as the Governor's Fire Prevention Conference, began in August of 1959, when then Governor Taw saw the need for a statewide conference on fire prevention. 58 years later, the Mid-Atlantic Life Safety Conference remains one of the most foremost conferences of its kind in the nation. The Public Fire Safety Educator of the Year Award was officially renamed in 2017 as the John C. Spiker Sr. Life Safety Educator of the Year Award. Presented by his son, John Spiker Jr., Kimberly Smith of the Rivera Beach Volunteer Fire Department in Arundel County, where John was an active member, received the first renamed award. She has shown a true dedication to public fire safety education and is an asset both to her department and to the citizens of Maryland. Mark your calendars for Tuesday, September 25th for this year, 2018, for yet another well-prepared conference. Please go on to the fabscom.org website and fill out your application to attend this well-rounded conference designed for you and your peers. One of my top priorities as a state fire marshal is to ensure the safety and well-being of my employees. In 2017, the agency has seen its first steps towards better health, mainly in cancer prevention. Our first round of pickup trucks were ordered and the pickup truck will provide the needed separation between the good stuff and the bad stuff. You know what I'm talking about. We're taking cancer-causing hazards of fire investigations out of the passenger compartments of our vehicles. We have one on a display downstairs in our booth in the main hall. Please take a moment to check it out. We also purchased five set of personal protective ensembles, and with the gracious assistance of Fabscom, we were able to apply and receive close to 20000 in grant funds from Firehouse Subs. This grant money is being used to support our agency's health and wellness agenda. We have purchased new helmets and new hard hats for investigators and inspectors, as well as 10 new four gas meters, which can be monitored off-site. I want to thank Fabscom and Firehouse Subs for continued support of our mission and the citizens of Maryland. We've also put into place a policy now where uh, folks need to uh, wear all their gear, respiratory protection. Uh, they've had uh, instructions on how to decon themselves after a fire scene, and uh, we think that's going to help in the long run. Obviously, we lost our ward last year to brain cancer. I truly believe that that was an occupational cancer disease, and we have one of our other retired members now suffering with a blood cancer. So we hope that these policies that we put in place, the pickup trucks, the new gear, uh, are all going to protect our folks so they have a healthy retirement with their families. In 2017, the Bomb Squad unit accepted delivery of a 26-foot Pro-Line center console boat. The boat was purchased with grant funds received from FEMA and is to complement our underwater hazardous devices team. The new vessel expands the team's ability to provide a quicker and safer response any part of the state in the event the team is deployed. To boost a little morale throughout the agency in 2017, we unveiled a new state fire marshal Maryland registration plates. The plates are open to all current and retired employees of the agency. Near and dear to Chief Deputy Durr is helping those in Maryland in need. And I have to apologize, the chief is uh, away in training for three weeks down in Huntsville, Alabama. He's down learning about how to blow stuff up and learn things about explosives. So uh, something he didn't have in his past life at Howard County Police Department. So we're trying to educate him a little bit more about that. So he's down there this uh, these next couple of weeks. So, But in December of 2017, our agency partnered with State Farm Insurance to adopt a family. Through this partnership, the OSFM adopted the Pittman family after they were displaced from their home on Don Court in Salisbury through a fire which was determined to be arson. 
The family was beginning to prepare for Christmas season when this fire occurred, and they lost all their personal possessions as a result of the fire. The single mother and two children were devastated by this event, of which they had no control over. The fire investigation determined that someone had unlawfully entered the home, ransacked the interior, stole property, and set the house on fire to conceal the crime. Members of the OSFM went shopping and delivered holiday cheer to the family. Items given to included a Christmas tree with decorations, television, DVD player, laptop computer, a platform hitch for Ms. Pittman's vehicle, which will enable her to transport her disabled son's wheelchair, as well as fire safety items including 10-year smoke alarms, portable fire extinguishers. Also in conjunction with these efforts, a Christmas Eve dinner was delivered. We continue to keep the Pittman family in our prayers. As in years past, the OSFM experienced a few staffing changes in 2017. Deputy Chief Deputy Sander Cohen was promoted to Deputy Chief of the North Seas Regional Office. In May, we announced the appointment of Chief Deputy Greg Durr as a retired, a retired officer with the Howard County Police Department. Since his appointment, Chief Durr has been an incredible asset to the agency. Unfortunately, as I said, he could not be here today. He's in training in Alabama. We also welcomed Deputy State Fire Marshal Brandon Beal and Fire Inspector Edward Goodrich both currently assigned to our Western Regional Office, and Fire and Safety Inspector Millett assigned to our Southern Regional Office. Please join us in supporting their successes as they serve the citizens of Maryland. Additionally, we have several retirements. Deputy State Fire Marshal Tim Warner and Administrative Officer Allison Turner, both with 24 years of dedicated service, and Fire Protection Engineer Dan Hong after six years of service, all retired from the agency. Wish them great success in their future endeavors. In addition to those, unfortunately, we also saw our own Captain MSFA, Bruce Bouch, move on to do great work at the federal level working for the U.S. Fire Administration at the National Fire Academy. Bruce is greatly missed, and you can ask anyone who helped me write this report if you do not believe me. In 2017, we also lost Accelerant Detection Canine Charlie. Canine Charlie and his partner, Deputy Chief John, Nelson worked about 500 fire scenes. During Charlie's eight years of active service, Charlie was 11 years old when he passed. We and John's family miss Charlie and appreciate all the work he provided to ensure the safety of all male owners in the communities throughout the United States. The OSFM staff continues to perform at high levels in 2017. The OSFM conducted 974 investigations of which 708 were fire-related and 211 were explosive-related. A total of 778 criminal cases were closed by arrests, with 118 individuals being arrested. The agency-wide arson closure rate was 29%, which is well above the national average. This level of performance is outstanding in light of the increased training, fire and life safety education assignments, and the lack of full staffing that we have at the agency. A total of 12,343 fire and life safety inspections were completed in 2017, and the OSFM fire protection engineers reviewed 1,379 construction and fire protection system plans. The dedication of our personnel is evident by these numbers. It is through an agency-wide commitment to fire and life safety that we work for the citizens and with the Maryland Fire Service to accomplish the mission of protecting life and property from fire and explosions. Following the apartment explosion in late August of 2016 in Montgomery County, a necessary ability for the OSM to rapidly deploy resources to large-scale incidents statewide became apparent. In January of 2017, we established a major incident response team. The MERT is divided into three teams. Each team consists of certified fire investigators, bomb technicians, fire protection engineers, canine, and command staff. The team is available to any jurisdiction that determines the need for assistance in any capacity. In 2017, the MERT responded to five incidents. In March, we responded to two requests, the first in Howard County for a large single-family dwelling fire, and the second in Montgomery County for a fatal house explosion. In June, the team was activated for a large commercial structure fire in Frederick County, and in August for a fatal house explosion in Carroll County, and in September for a large warehouse fire in Baltimore City. As I do each and every year, I'm again asking each of you to place more emphasis on fire and injury prevention. We need to continue to take every opportunity to prevent the 911 call and to inform our communities about fire and injury prevention. 
take the time now and when you go back home from the convention to network with other departments, the MSFA Fire and Prevention Life Safety Committee, NFPA, MarylandLifeSafety.org, and get those fire and injury prevention messages out into your community each and every day. Take any and all opportunities to interact with the public, not just during Fire Prevention Week. Provide fire safety information to your folks in your community that are attending your fundraising events that many of you hold throughout the year. When you do have a fire incident, try and make a point to get back in that area as soon as possible and talk to the folks that were impacted by that event in the community. Make sure your personnel are checking to see if smoke alarms are present on each and every response to homes within your community. Promote the 10-year sealed battery smoke alarms, escape plans, get out, stay out, and to close the doors while sleeping and when evacuating during an active fire incident and immediately calling 911 simple five things that you got to tell these folks. And you saw that it worked in Salisbury just at the end of May. Also network with neighboring departments and the American Red Cross. Establish teams to install smoke alarms in homes located in your community and conduct fire safety reviews as you can see, as you can see from the American Red Cross fire risk map. The dark red areas is where we need to focus our efforts. Fairly in Baltimore City, our western counties and several counties on the eastern shore. Focus on these populations that continue to be impacted by fire. As we said earlier, they're very young, they are elderly, and those who have disabilities, all of which are factors that prevent a timely escape from fire. Go to schools, daycare facilities, senior centers, county fairs, those that you have Christmas tree lots, and other locations where folks in your community will be located. Do not wait for them to call you. Reach out, ask to visit them, and share the information and knowledge you have on preventing fires and injuries. It takes very little time, but the information you will share goes a long way in the end to saving lives. Again, prime example is these two young men that were here just, just a little while ago. They learned about it, they remembered. The older one, I was told, you know, he thought about going back inside, but he remembered. He learned not to go back in. That's why you end up running around the house yelling fire, 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 and somebody called the fire department. So they're learning, but we have to get that information to them so they can learn those lessons and we can save more lives. The OSFM blog site continues to be updated for your use. The site contains news and information. Fatality and burn injury reports can be completed securely online. Local jurisdictions can also share smoke alarm saves fire sprinkler saves and our customers can now request fire safety inspections and submit arson tips from the blog site. It is my distinct pleasure now I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief State Fire Marshal Karen McMahon as she will announce the Regional Deputy State Fire Marshals of the Year. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you now to join me in honoring our Regional Deputy State Fire Marshals of the Year for 2017. Deputy State Fire Marshals Carl Whitmere from the Western Region Office. Carl is unable to be with us this afternoon. Deputy State Fire Marshal Dexter Hodges from the Epler Eastern Shore Region, Regional Office. Deputy State Fire Marshal Kirby Travers of the Lower Eastern Shore Regional Office. Brandon Shepard of the Southern Regional Office. and Matthew Wren of our bomb squad, who was unable to be with us today attending K-9 training. Each of these individuals represents their peers with great devotion and distinction. Each has gone above and beyond the call of duty. They come to work every day looking forward to the challenge and making Maryland a safer place to live, work, play, and raise a family. 
It is important to note that each of these deputies have aspired to this level with a, with a strong support of their supervisors, the administrative staff, and their fellow fire safety inspectors, fire protection engineers, and deputy state fire marshals. As always, the job of the Deputy State Fire Marshal of the Year Selection Committee is extremely difficult, and this year was definitely no exception. I want to thank all of the members that served with this committee, along with this committee with me. The letters of nomination were filled with examples of the exemplary duty and customer service deserving of much more than this award provides. To each of you, I sincerely thank you for your service and your devotion to our duty. Can we all give them another round of applause? I now have the great pleasure of introducing to you the 2017 James C. Robertson Deputy State Fire Marshal of the Year. During 2017, this Deputy State Fire Marshal excelled in their responsibilities involving the fire marshal profession. This deputy established himself as a thorough and cosmic professional with a great deal of confidence in their ability. This deputy has consistently demonstrated themselves as a motivated and reliable employee who is ready to offer support to his peers and always, rep always represents the Office of the State Fire Marshal in a positive manner. This highly respected investigator has excelled in each and every aspect of their career and is a model employee for our agency. This deputy was cited for their many achievements in 2017, such as an average of 3.25 fire investigations per month and established a 30% arson case closure rate when the national average is 18%. He is lauded for, for performing extra work to successful clo successfully close cases and providing critical assistance in helping to close multiple additional cases being investigated by his peers. He works countless hours networking with allied law enforcement agencies and additional resources. He has successfully completed with the minimum law enforcement and fire investigation training, but has not stopped there. He has excelled in obtaining additional training and improving his professional development. He has focused on cell phone diagnosis and analysis, which has greatly assisted other investigators around the state. It is my honor to present the James C. Robertson Award recognizing the Deputy State Fire Marshal of the Year for 2017 to Deputy State Fire Marshal Brandon Shepard of the Southern Regional Office. and I'll turn the rest of it over to Fire Marshal Geraci. It really makes my job easy, doesn't it? When you have great people, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, uh, I've been truly blessed throughout my fire service career to uh, have commands where uh, I've just had outstanding employees that do outstanding work each and every day. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how I got so lucky in doing that. So in closing, all members of the OSFM will continue to perform their public safety mission with dedication and pride, but challenges come more opportunities. We're always seeking potential opportunities to better perform our mission, and with your support, continually move both our agency and, more importantly, the Maryland Fire Service forward. As an organization, the entire staff of the OSFM has a clear picture of its mission. OSFM staff members look forward to working closely with MSFA President Rick Blair and LA MSFA President Marsha Roth and their leadership teams in this upcoming year. We wish them great success and know they will achieve their goals established during their terms in office. Please continue to make fire and energy prevention the most important service that your department provides in your community and reinforce that mem message with your members each and every day. Thank you for all of your support and dedication and devotion to keeping Maryland fire safe. 
enjoy the rest of the convention, and please have a safe trip on your return home. And please, may the peace of the Lord continue to watch over Cohen family, all Sanders friends, our OSFM family, the Maryland Fire Service, and the great state of Maryland. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Fire Marshal Tracy. We have before you, for you today a certificate of special recognition, a mug, and a bag. I would like to introduce the Executive Director of MIFRI, Chief Michael Cox, and the Assistant Director, Larry Preston, for their report. Thank you, President Bilger. Welcome, everyone. First and foremost, congratulations on your 126th convention. It's a tremendous feat. The Maryland State Firemen's Association is an organization that is steeped in history and tradition, as well as uh, become a tremendous leader in the fire service. President Bilger, Vice Presidents Blair and Faust, officers, delegates, and members of the Maryland State Firemen's Convention, it has been a true honor to work with the various committees and members of the MSFA this year to provide state-of-the-art emergency services training programs to the EMS fire and rescue agencies in our great state. This year, we were able to provide a vast array of diverse programs to help our first responders prepare themselves to mitigate the numerous incidents that they are faced with day in and day out. This year, we were able to train more than 34,000 emergency responders here in the state of Maryland. That equated to 1,756 emergency services programs and more than 829,000 instructional hours. Our programs by discipline consisted of about 7,900 students in our fire programs, 6,500 students in our EMS programs, another 1,100 students in our advanced life support programs, 2,800 students in our rescue programs, 4,900 students in our management programs, more than 1,700 personnel were in our hazardous materials programs, and more than 3,000 students attended specialty programs. 1,600 students attended company drills, 1,200 attended different executive uh, seminars, and more than 3,000 students participated in the simulation center. Uh, here at Mifri. I would like to thank the members of MSFA for their hard work and unwavering commitment to improving the Maryland Fire Service as well as the outstanding services they provide to the visitors and residents of our state. On one additional note, I do want to offer a special thanks uh, to Steve Cox, Johnny Roth, and Richard Smith. These gentlemen's uh, work on the legislative committee was unwavering and a tremendous asset to the other fire and EMS organizations in the state. I look forward to our continued success, making the Maryland EMS Fire and Rescue Services the best that they can be. And with that, I would like to ask uh, President Bilger to come on out. I have a little plaque and gift here for you. It's presented to Mark A. Bilger, the president in recognition of your successful term as president of the Maryland State Firemen's Association, your dedication to Maryland's fire and rescue services, along with your experience and professionalism, has been very much appreciated. On behalf of the men and women of the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, I wish you continued success. Congratulations.
briefly have for you an official convention mug, a bag, and a certificate of recognition for the support and help that MIFRI provides us every day. I'd like to call to the podium the acting director of MICRB, Pat Marlette. President Bilger, officers and members of the MSFA, uh, on behalf of the MICRB, we have a real quick report. We want to let you know that as of April, 8, uh, April 18th, we had 768 state emergency services instructors, 23 instructor trainers, and 266 evaluators. The next meeting of the MICRB is going to be on July 11th, and at that time, the process begins for the review and readoption of the instructor standards. For those of you that are instructors, we would strongly encourage you to participate in that process. For those of you that are, have instructors as part of your member companies, please, please instruct them or ask them to participate in the process of review. There are going to be some substantive changes or at least substantive in the eyes of the instructors because of the way that the uh, standard is written the recertification process, and for those in particular that are going to be re-entering the process because of failure to recertify on time, there will be some changes. So I strongly suggest that the instructors uh, take the time to be part of the process. Our full report has been submitted and we be part of the proceedings. Thank you. At this time, I would like to call to the podium co-acting -ex executive director Pat Gaynor and Dr. Richard Alcorder from MIMS for a presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to be here before you today, and we are delighted uh, to have an opportunity to provide an award to somebody that um, has served the MSFA so dedicatedly and diligently. Uh, Fred Cross, if you would be kind enough to step up here, please. Fred Cross, uh, president, past president, 1995-96, has been an advocate for the MSFA for basically most of his adult life. He has had an opportunity to serve uh, as a representative on the EMS board, where he has not been a timid soul. He has spoken out on behalf of the MSFA and the volunteers across the state of Maryland in a consistent and fervent way, supporting the initiatives and concerns representing the volunteers. Fred has stepped down voluntarily due to medical conditions, but he is here today to receive an award from the EMS board. The EMS board basically states that this is a certificate of appreciation for J George A. Fred Cross, Jr. for years of dedicated service to the State of Maryland's Emergency Medical Services Board. The commitment with which you have served has made a difference in the level of delivery of emergency medical services in the State of Maryland. So please give him a round of applause for his dedicated service. to be heading next door for those of you that want to listen to some great signs and symptoms I'll be doing my presentation turn it over to Pat good afternoon everyone it's nice to be here today uh, thanks for having 
having us. Uh, first off, I want to thank President Mark Bilger and congratulate him on a successful year. It's been a true pleasure working with him over the past year, and we look forward to continuing our work with the Maryland State Firemen's Association moving forward. I'm going to go through some slides. I'm going to go over a few of the highlights of the past year, 17 and 18, and then, t then talk a little bit about areas we're going to be focused on for the upcoming year moving forward. But first, before I get into that, I wanted to give everybody an update on where we stand with National Registry testing for basic providers. You'll remember that we began National Registry testing in 2014 for Maryland BLS providers. The initial results from National Registry testing were below, uh, far below what we had hoped and below the national average. So the EMS board convened a committee to work on this issue, partnering with members of the Maryland State Firemen's Association, MIFRI, and others to address, to find out what the problem is and to address the problems. At that time, we determined there were an insufficient number of testing sites for providers felt that they were not as well prepared to take the course as they could have been, and there were some confusions about the Maryland protocols and national practices that we needed to clear up. MIMS pays for the uh, national registry testing for basic providers for both the first test and if the provider fails the first test for the second test. And since we instituted national registry testing in 2014, we've spent $351,000. This is as of last week. So we've invested a significant amount of money to help uh, Maryland move to the national standard and to have all our providers tested to meet that standard. Well, how are we doing? We, we continue to do really well. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see that our initial pass rates uh, back in 2014 and then to 15 were well below the national average for EMT and EMR. 56% pass rate for EMT and 51 for EMR. Well, currently, our EMT pass rate is 79% and our EMR pass rate is 81%. A true uh, tribute to all the work that all the providers have put into this, the educational programs, the MSFA, and all the partners trying to address the problems that we had. Maryland has now reclaimed its, its rightful place as a leader in the nation, and we have a lot to be proud of. We have started our statewide communication system upgrade. Uh, we've been hearing about this for a few years, and it took us a while to get the money to do this, to pull together uh, the request for proposals. Very technical. It took us a long time to get that together. But the upgrade is going to move the statewide medical communication system from analog to digital going to integrate with the PSAPs as well as with the plan 700 megahertz system. We finally got approval from the Board of Public Works this past May, and the next day the uh, uh, entity that won the contract began surveying all the communications towers in Maryland as well as the hospitals to see exactly what work needed to be done and to chart out a, a timeline. We anticipate it's going to take about two years to finish this project, and we are looking forward to getting that Last year, uh, we transitioned uh, to an electronic image trend licensing and certification process to help um, move our licensing and certification process sort of into the, into the present as opposed to having it entirely paper-based. Um, we still accept uh, paper applications and all the uh, different change of address forms. Everything can be conducted uh, in paper, but a lot of the processes now are electronic. Um, applications, change of address, extension requests, etc., can all be done electronically, and it's proven to be a very good system. We've had some bugs. We pulled together a statewide steering committee, and they've been working over the past year to iron out those bugs. Uh, we have made some good progress. We're having enhancements in July and then again in September, and the July enhancements will allow for quicker processing and it will allow instructor training administrators to upload multiple training records all at one time instead of one at a time. And the August 
September update is going to allow providers to more efficiently be able to track their records in the system. We've also been working on upgrading eMeds to the new Elite platform. Uh, this is the Image Trend platform, and it allows us to go to an entirely new data standard, meeting the national Nemesis 3.4 data standard. The upgrade is being the cost of the upgrade is being borne by MIMS. It's no cost at all to the jurisdictions to do this. You can see from the map that as of last Friday, we have 11 jurisdictions that have gone live with Elite have moved to the new platform. Six more have confirmed their start date, and those start dates are this summer and the first part of September. Another six jurisdictions have uh, started the process to begin the upgrade. We've had meetings and we're setting the schedule with them. And then one county, uh, we are still in the process of setting the initial uh, kickoff meeting, and they are ready to move forward with that. Something we've been working a lot on uh, very diligently at is integrating eMeds with CRISP. And CRISP is the Health Information Exchange for Maryland, the Chesapeake Regional Information System for our patients, or CRISP, it's quite a mouthful. It's a way to share patient information electronically uh, among doctor's offices, hospitals, laboratories. And what we want to do is to integrate eMeds into that. So e uh, eventually, once we are able to do that, Providers in the field will be able to access patient records while they're treating the patient, and they can see the past hospitalizations, the medications, the test results that the patients have had in the patient's uh, past history that could help EMS uh, provide better, more effective care. We had a good pilot, a successful pilot in Prince George's County, and we have some early adopting counties who are moving forward with this integration, and we'll keep you posted on this. I just want to say a few words about the heroin and opioid crisis. Clay gave a great talk, and we have partnered with, with Clay and with the Opioid Operational Command Center to, to try to ease the burden on EMS providers that deal with these calls every day. Uh, as everyone knows, there's been a, a, an incredible increase in the number of responses that EMS has had to deal with for suspected overdoses, and that's placed a burden on the EMS jurisdictions. One of the burdens that is placed on the jurisdictions has been financial, because we're finding that many many opioid patients, it used to be about a year ago, it was about 19 to 20%, now it's 26%. When 911 is called to treat them, they will be uh, resuscitated, essentially. They will receive naloxone, naloxone, but then the patient will refuse transport to a hospital or to a stabilization center. That's a double burden for EMS. Not only do they have to respond and provide the service, and they provide life-saving care to the patient, but EMS cannot bill to receive to recover the cost of naloxone. And, and we worked with Clay and his folks because that burden should not be borne by the jurisdiction. Through the Opioid Operational Command Center, we were able to get a $200,000 grant that we turned around to the jurisdictions to help them cover the cost of naloxone to ease that financial burden a bit. We are also uh, in the midst of implementing a naloxone leave behind program. And this is partnering with uh, the Maryland Department of Health's Behavioral Health Administration. We have eight counties that are participating in this. Uh, Frederick, Allegheny, Montgomery, Baltimore City, Anne Arundel, St. Mary's, Washington, and Howard. And what, how this operates is when EMS responds to an overdose and administers naloxone, they will leave behind another dose of naloxone with the patient's family uh, in case the patient should need it uh, another time. Again, that's being, the naloxone is being provided at no cost to the jurisdictions. And this is a little bit of a pilot program. We'll see how it works in these eight jurisdictions and whether or not uh, other ju jurisdictions will be interested in joining as we move forward. Fine, or not finally, but beginning in July, on July 1, MIMS is obligated, will be obligated by law, to submit information to the high in Baltimore, Washington, Washington, Baltimore High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Overdose Mapping Application. And what these folks are trying to do is identify in real time where overdoses are occurring so they can marshal responses to deal in that to deal with the crisis in that geographic area. We will be turning over um, to these folks date and time information of the overdose, the 
approximate address of where the overdose occurred, whether naloxone was applied, and whether or not the overdose was fatal or not fatal. And finally, Baltimore City has uh, opened up its stabilization center. It's up and running. Uh, the stabilization center will deal not only with opioid patients, but also with alcohol patients as well, and we'll see how that works. One area we've focused a lot of attention on this year, and it's going to be a big focus next year, is on EMS reimbursement. Um, I mentioned before that EMS is not reimbursed uh, in, at times when naloxone is administered and the patient's not transported to an emergency department. Well, EMS is not reimbursed unless a patient is transported, and most often those transports go to a hospital emergency department. This, these reimbursement practices grow out of Medicare, which only uh, allows EMS to be paid if the patient is transported to a hospital. So what's happened is that Medicaid has picked that up, and a lot of private insurance companies have picked that up as well. We think that's not fair. Uh, we think that also uh, puts EMS in a tough situation trying to deal with what's happening in the hospital. Uh, hospital emergency departments are high-cost environments to treat patients, particularly if the patients can be treated in other uh, settings like uh, urgent care centers. I don't need to tell EMS about emergency department overcrowding and long wait times. Maryland has the worst wait times in the emergency department uh, of any other state in the nation. EMS waits a long time to offload their patients, and that backs up the entire EMS system. It affects the ability of EMS to respond to 911 calls. So we have been focusing on this because EMS uh, needs to be reimbursed for what they're doing. And at the same time, EMS is moving toward developing new models of care delivery where not every patient has to go to the emergency department. And I'm just going to very quickly mention the three that we're focusing on. The first is mobile integrated health. Mobile integrated health uh, focuses on frequent flyers, those folks who call 911 system frequently, uh, overuse of the 911 system, particularly when they don't have uh, emergency conditions, particularly if they, if they have chronic conditions that should be cared for in other health environments. EMS partners with other types of health care providers like nurses and physicians uh, to provide resources and to provide care in the patient's home and to connect the patient with resources in the community. The overall goal is to reduce the volume of 911 calls for these frequent flyers and to improve the patient's care. We have seven MIH programs in Maryland. Queen Anne's was the first adopter in Montgomery County, Prince George's, Salisbury, Wicomico, Charles, Baltimore City, and Frederick County. And these programs have tremendous potential in trying to better meet the patient's needs for these frequent flyers who uh, are, again, burdening the 911 system in certain areas. Another uh, new model of care delivery we're focusing on is alternative destinations. And this would be when a 911 patient with a low acuity condition can be treated at an environment other than an emergency department, such as an urgent care center. Now, instituting this would require changes to the Maryland medical protocols, and those changes would be coming in a couple of years. But we are paving the way for EMS to, re to be reimbursed once those changes are made. And again, the patients who would be eligible for these ty types of transport would be the low acuity patients, the priority threes. And finally, we're looking at uh, treat and refer or treat without transport. And this is where EMS responds to a 911 call and provides care in the patient's home or another location without further transporting them to an ED or even an, uh, an urgent care center. Uh, this is another model that we think has tremendous potential and would allow EM EMS to provide the care to the patient at the patient's home in a, in a more cost-efficient way. So we've been encouraged on this path to find these new models of health care and reimbursement for them by a bill that was considered in the legislature this past year. And that bill is requiring MIMS to work with the Maryland Health Care Commission to develop a plan to get Medicaid reimbursement for EMS for those uh, new models of health care delivery. We are to identify a process for obtaining Medicare reimbursement, and in order to do that, we have to approach the federal government and work, work things out with the feds. And then finally, regarding the private insurance companies, we are supposed to be working with them to study the issue and make recommendations as to how they could begin to reimburse EMS for these types of transports. We uh, have pulled together 
the group. We have a steering committee of state agencies that are looking at this. Uh, we had a meeting last week with all the payers in the state to advise them what we're doing and where, where we'd like to go. We're going to be working through the summer and fall, and we have to turn in our report, our findings to the legislature by January the 1st. So it's a tremendous amount of work, but we, we feel the need to get this done, and we're very motivated, and I'm sure we will get there. Now, just a few words about hot issues for the next year. First of all, uh, I, I will say we are, as you know, we've been looking for an executive director, and I feel very confident that this time next year, standing up here, will be a new executive director at MIMS. We have some candidates that are very promising, and we are hoping to do interviews in the late summer and fall. So fingers crossed we will have a new executive director for MIMS. And I'm sure as most of you have heard, Dr. Alcorta is going to be retiring uh, in October, at the end of October, and um, another loss for, for the system and for our agency. But we're, we are working to identify a successor to Dr. Alcorta. Ideally, we will get someone on contract before Dr. Alcorta leaves, and then once Dr. Alcorta retires, that person will just move into the position permanently. We're going to continue to work on the heroin and opioid overdose initiatives, integration with Chris, the elite, the communications upgrade, and the reimbursement uh, for EMS for new health care delivery. We're also keeping an eye on changes to the Maryland healthcare system at large that impact EMS. There are some hospitals that are converting from acute care hospitals to freestanding medical facilities, and those conversions can affect communities and can affect EMS because EMS will no longer have the hospital as a re that hospital as a receiving point for a patient who needs something more than emergency care. If a patient needs to have an operation or needs hospitalization, they have to be transported somewhere else. So we review the applications for hospitals that want to make that conversion, and we assess the impact it's going to have on EMS, make a recommendation to the EMS board about what that impact is, and then the EMS board reports those findings to the Health Care Commission, and the Health Care Commission has the ultimate say as to whether or not that goes forward. But we wanted to make sure that the Health Care Commission took into account the impact of such a conversion on EMS and the uh, emergency care system. And that, that's pretty much that's pretty much it for our hot issues that we can foresee at this point. Uh, thank you again to the Maryland State Firemen's Association. We so value the partnership we have, and we look forward to working with everyone moving forward. Thank you. Thank you again for the presentation. We have a certificate of recognition a conference bag and a mug. I would like to introduce Christy Snedeker, Director, Care Management and Clinical Operations with R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center to provide you with our um, quality report. I gave you two slides at once and they didn't tell me how to move it backwards. I feel like I'm the first one that did that today. I 
data that I'm going to provide you is data for the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center through quarter three of our fiscal year that ends um, June 30th. And so our annual report that we provide um, uh, coming out in August will have our, our fiscal year data. So in these slides, the blue bars represent last fiscal year and the red bars represent this fiscal year through quarter three March. So you can see our volumes are holding steady per volume per uh, total encounters. We're down about 164 patient visits um, through the end of March, but steadily increasing as the weather has gotten better and our volumes have increased. Our critical care resuscitation unit patient admissions are steady as well as our lung rescue unit um, occupancy rate, which is above 85%. Lost inner hospital transfers is um, an, important metric, an important metric for us. And uh, if you can see on the, the graph on the left, the gray bars represent our lost inner hospital trans transfers, which are nicely declining throughout the year, as well as our capacity alert status, which is the red line on that graph, which we monitor closely to ensure that the trauma center's front door remains open 100% of the time. We only had one incidence of going on total bypass for the trauma center this year, and that was in accordance with our helipad refurbishment project, which we were on bypass for maybe 60 minutes, and then opened our doors again. Our inner hospital transfer volume, um, the other two graphs on this page represent trauma and, and non-trauma inner hospital transports with um, the red and the blue, fiscal year 17 to 18. As, where, as well as our air, air scene versus air inner hospital transport steady, steady across both fiscal years as well. Monitoring our length of stay and our patient throughput is always in the front of our minds as we know that we are the primary adult, adult resource center for the state and it's important for us to be able to accept patients 365 days out of the year, but it's almost also critically important of how we move the patients through our hospital and their actual length of stay. And so you can see the gray line is our actual length of stay for budget, um, and we're just about 0.36 over budget. We're working very hard on establishing the route of care for our patients and moving them to the next level as it's deemed medically necessary. OR volumes and clinic volumes have decreased a little bit um, over the year, but I assure you, um, rapidly increasing as we've moved into our last quarter of the fiscal year. As the hypobaric referral center for the state of Maryland, um, this uh, page represents our hyperbaric chamber dive hours, uh, where for this fiscal year we're running a little bit above budget by 54 hours. And on the two smaller pie charts, you'll see um, the, uh, the, case, the case type in hours, where we see emergent um, patients coming in for hyperbaric treatment, as well as taking our inpatients down to the chamber and accepting outpatient volume, which is the majority of our volume across fiscal years. Our Shock Trauma Go team, um, has been requested 12 times this so far this fiscal year. We've had three deployments of that anesthesia-driven um, GO team that gets called to the scene to help um, support those that are there to make sure that the patient gets the care that they deserve um, at the scene as well as during transport to the most appropriate facility. As comparable to fiscal year 17, we had seven GO team deployments and this year we've had three so far. Organ and tissue donation is a strong program within the R. Adams Cali Shock Trauma Center. This data through calendar year 2018 shows us being at 83% donation rate, which is above our goal of 75%. Um, we have a meaningful donation discussions um, with our patients and their families. And you can see on this slide a picture of our physician in chief, Dr. Tom Scalia, and our senior vice president of nursing and operations, Karen Doyle. Um, they had the pleasure of signing roses that were then donated to the 2018 Donate Life Rose Parade float to reflect um, our commitment to the donation of life. We can
continue to have a very robust global outreach trauma observation program. This slide depicts where we have had our most recent observation um, program attendees. Um, most recently to date, we have two visiting us from Greece. Um, it's a very robust program and they get to come in and see our trauma care and take it back to their countries to develop their own. The Center for Injury Prevention and Policy is also another very robust gold standard program. Um, fiscal year to date, we've had over 258 events, touching over 12,000 attendees. Some of those programs could be for teens or adults for trauma prevention. Um, our Trauma Survivors Network is extremely robust inside our hospital. Um, um, during the initial phases of a patient's um, medical course, throughout their recovery, um, supporting Minds of the Future, and um, partnering with Committee on Trauma for the Stop the Bleed campaign has been truly a magnificent um, program and commitment that we've had um, to date. Violence prevention programs also continue to be paramount as we've seen violence rise within the city of Baltimore um, and the need for prevention and support. Our EMS outreach and education activities also continue to be um, on the forefront of our minds. Without those, where would we be with your help and support? Um, I'm sorry I'm getting attacked by this fly up here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's really just coming at me, so pardon me for all the swatting. Um, Pre-hospital education activity that we do provide, um, we have observation programs within the trauma center. Um, we provide tours. We also have um, a very advanced airway course that we provide to EMS providers that we've, since in the past two years, implemented simulation into that program. So cadaver training, simulation training, and didactic training has really made that course um, popular among many. We still continue to provide our evening broadcasts as well as outreach activities, most most um, notably uh, for this week, our orthopedic trauma and shock trauma go team um, lectures that we provided for this convention. I do want to thank everyone for their um, attendance and support for our annual shock trauma gala that we had this past April. Again, we got to come together and, and celebrate our teams, the collaboration and the partnership that we know um, is the root of our trauma center and care delivery for the state of Maryland. And so that night was featured two patient um, uh, cases where we could showcase all the way from pre-hospital dispatch to um, next level of care for those patients as they move through the trauma center. It was a lovely evening. It was wonderful to see many of you there. And we look forward to our next event next April the 13th. So mark the calendars. Thank you. And have a great rest of your week. Okay. Thank you again. We have a certificate of recognition, a bag, and a mug for you. announcements again from till 1700 hours we have education training seminars going on 4:30 the exhibits will close six o'clock bag bingo convention center bayfront ballroom doors open at 5 6 30 will be family night at jolly rogers if you haven't got your tickets there's still time to do that also all judges and tellers must report tomorrow because we will be voting on a constitution by law change also, please take time to visit the exhibitors who help pay for your convention. This time, I'd like to call Assistant Chaplain Harry Hetz the benediction.
Let us rise as we are able. Gracious God, as we bring this session to a close, Father, we thank you for your blessings over us. We thank you for your guidance and your wisdom given us understanding. Father, dismiss us as we recess, refresh us with the night of rest and fellowship. Bring us back tomorrow with new energy to deal with the business of this association. Be with those that need a touch of your healing hand. Let your mercies and graces go out. Reach out to those that are grieving, Father, and we just ask that your comfort be with them. Surround them. Bring them a measure of your peace. Dismiss us now. Whichever are going out, whichever are coming in, whichever all who place themselves in harm's way to protect our lives, our communities, and our way of life. For all these things, we thank you. Amen. Again, voting will be from 8 a.m. till 10 tomorrow. Don't forget to visit the vendors downstairs. And at this point, we're recessed until 8.30 tomorrow morning.